Okay, this morning we're going to be uh, not doing a Bible study on Halloween. I, I don't want to think that, and that's kind of weird a th thought presentation. But really, just looking at the this uh, holiday, it's pretty uh, one of the more major ones in in our country, surprisingly enough, and uh, especially when it comes to spending money. This is one of the, one of the top holidays, which you kind of go, what? Oh, it's because of candy and costumes and stuff. So, but uh, there's some there's some interesting things that are part of where this came from, uh, connections with another major celebration that's probably reasonably celebrated by 100 million people or more uh, that you may not be aware of, but you probably will, if you have your eyes open, you'll probably notice it more and more uh, because of some of the changes going on in our country. And uh, so anyway, I, I think it'd be valuable for you because they touch on some spiritual issues that really connect with all of us at some point in life. So it's not just like, oh, yeah, like I want to do a history lesson on Halloween. No, it's not going to be that. But uh, you'll get a little bit of history, but I, I try to keep it small. So, all right, let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for this morning, and thank you for your love, Lord. And uh, we thank you for the cross of our Savior. Jesus, we thank you for laying down your life for us. And uh, pray that we would see, again, in a new way, uh, how it applies to uh, different areas that ha have to do with our life, how we live. And uh, where we live and uh, the people we live around and in the midst of, Lord, uh, help us to see you know, the power of the gospel uh, for all these things. And, Lord, help us to be carriers of the light of your truth into a dark world. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, obviously Halloween is one of those things that as Christians you kind of go, ah, it's kind of it's got, got kind of a weird spiritual overturn, overtures to it. And uh, but I want to share with you some of the things of, of where it actually comes from. We're, we're familiar with some of the basic stuff. I'm pretty sure most of you guys know this information that's celebrated on October 31st. That's uh, coming up. And that's why Sam said, hey, you know, it's the 31st, right? And then uh, the word, the name Halloween is kind of a, it's one of those words you go, well, that's a weird word. Where did that even come from? Well, it, it's a shortening or contracting of All Hallows Evening. And it's, you're going to see this, it's connected to a, really a Catholic celebration of All Saints Day or All Hallows Day. And the, the day before that, the evening before that, is the evening before All Hallows. So it goes Halloween, Hallow Evening, right? So the traditional, the traditional activities, we're pretty familiar, trick-or-treating. Uh, we don't really do a whole lot of that here in, in Big Bear. Uh, it, it, and you, you'll, if you think about it, you probably notice that when you were growing up, there were certain things that were done and they're not universal. Not everybody does it the same way. There's lots of individual varying celebrations. Uh, our kids that grow up here in Big Bear, if, if they grow up in Big Bear, they're gonna, not going to know what trick-or-treating is because we don't have sidewalks and we don't have street lights, and so they never go, I mean, rarely go house to house. So what they do is they come down to the village, which is kind of a nice thing. The village does that and gives them an opportunity to go down there, and then that's one of the reasons we do what we do because we're kind of connected in a you know, close proximity and allows people to come and get a chance to enjoy our harvest party at the same time. But uh, you know, most of you grew up going down the street, walking through neighborhoods and stuff like that. You, you, don't, you don't really want to do that in Big Bear. There's coyotes and <laughs> bears and you know, dark and stuff. So, uh, and, and then uh, bonfires, bonfires, uh, that's something we don't do in Big Bear, right? We, we don't do bonfires, <laughs> right? But, but surprisingly, uh, across the country, there's a lot of places where they still do that today. We were just back in Minnesota for a wedding. I, I was gone last Sunday for uh, Joy Junior, Joy Webb Junior's wedding, and uh, in one of the cities, uh, I think it was Wabasha, Minnesota. We, we went through there, and there's this giant lot with a big old pile, and we're going, "What the heck is that all about?" And then it's like, "Uh, bonfire," and that's what they do. They they put those big old bonfire and, you, and that's there's a lot of things that connect when we understand the background you go oh yeah that makes perfect sense they, they would gather together it's usually pretty cold a bonfire is a nice thing you know I mean you think of a campfire on a big scale uh, and you know people would gather together and they'd you know have this fire sometimes they'd throw stuff from harvesting stuff sometimes it'd just be wood from the forest or whatever but they don't have any lights they don't have street lights they don't have so it's, it's dark, and the light's a nice thing, and the heat's a nice thing. And with that, uh, you know, uh, th comes the, the idea of um, bats, because the insects are attracted to the light, and then the bats come because of that. I don't know how you feel about bats. I think they're kind of creepy. 
you know, I mean, they're not like I want to have one as a pet, you know, but, uh, you know, but uh, they're just, they're just critters, but, you know, that's how they get kind of associated with the whole Halloween thing, the bats flying and stuff, because it comes from this kind of background. Costumes we know about, parties and candy and haunted houses and jack-o'-lanterns, carving of jack-o'-lanterns, and even though, even just now, today, across our country, I mean, modern times across our country, there's a lot of variations of how, how the celebrations take place. Uh, it comes from the original uh, holiday of Samhain, which is that's uh, a Celtic festival, and it was uh, specifically originated for the celebrating the end of the harvest. Okay, so uh, I don't know about you guys, but it, it was very obvious to me when we went back this uh, to Minnesota. Uh, I am not a farmer, and, and I really I I, th- I thought about it. I said I don't know any farmers. No, I actually know one, but. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. I, I didn't grow up around that kind of thing. And so farms and farming and all that kind of, it's just foreign to me. I'm a Southern California guy who grew up in basically a desert. You know, <laughs> you don't grow anything here, right? So, uh, but when you get back to the Midwest, it's like farms everywhere. Farming is everything. Farming is, I mean, it's, it, it's every place you drive, every place you look, there's farms, farms, farms. And, and so you start to get, oh, this is a different deal. This is... Uh, the end of the harvest was a huge celebration, and they, they in particularly in England, Scotland, Ireland, these places, the colder countries, they grew lots of corn, and happens to be in the Midwest where we were. There's a lot of corn. Corn harvest comes in. Pumpkins are part of it. Those are things that are traditionally part of the celebration of Halloween. It's like, where did it come from? Well, because it started out as a harvest festival, Right? Bonfires because it's cold, and then, as I said, the insects and the bats come come with that, right? Uh, this is, this is a, today, I mean, if you drove back in through large sections of Minnesota and probably other states back there, you see a lot of fields with corn standing in the fields like this. It hasn't been harvested. They're letting it dry probably for uh, feed purposes. It's not for the, you know, eating consumption for us, but um, and, and it's just huge amounts, and they use this stuff for decorations. Because when they harvest all this stuff, then they go, ah, well, we've got, we got, we got more than enough of it. Uh, this is just to give you a little idea. The dark green and the, the darker the shade of green, it gives you a little scale on the side. That's, that's areas of the country that are 80 to 100% devoted to farming. Now, you, you see the, the little white big triangle over there? It looks like San Mariano County. That's where I grew up. Zero. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, so. Y- I just, for me, it was just an eye-opener. It's like, well, of course I, I never knew any of this stuff. I didn't grow up around farms. But you can see that's a huge portion of our country that's devoted to growing food for the rest of us. And so uh, when you're a farmer, the harvest, the end of the harvest, the fall harvest, it's like you worked all year essentially for this conclusion. And so it's a time of celebration. Uh, I mean, celebrating one thing. We're not working anymore for a while. That's kind of a break. But also, all the results of your labor has come in. So it's a time of celebration. You can understand if you're a farmer, it's like, yeah, we're going to celebrate, right? It's a, it's a good thing. So this is uh, Wabasha, Minnesota. And just to give you a little example, you see the corn stalks in the back and the pumpkins there. And it, this stuff they grow right there. They got them everywhere. And th- this, all the small towns it's, that we drove through in Minnesota, every one of them decorated their downtown, their main you know, downtown area, several blocks wide and with this kind of stuff. It's just decorations, all about fall harvest. And, uh, you know, Tina, that's Tina in the checker jacket, Joey and Lori over there, you see them. Uh, tourists, yeah, typical tourists. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we're walking down the street and, we, and we're looking at these things, it's like, these are real pumpkins. You know, th- you're probably not surprised by that. I'm surprised by that. I'm from Southern California. And I'm thinking, oh, you could never do that in California. I mean, think about what would happen if you put a bunch of real pumpkins on the street and left them alone. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't be there, right? They'd be smashed all over the place and stuff. And I'm going, they're everywhere. And you're just going, wow, this is, this is different, right? Now, here's Wabasha and a little place for you to take your picture. I didn't do it. But, you know, you see, again, you see the decorations. Just, they're all harvest-related. It's all, it's, it's all part of this fall festival thing. And you go, oh, that's interesting because that's really, that's the roots of it, right? The, the, we know that there's a spiritual component of it, and you know, where'd that come from? Well, it came from the Celts, which uh, it's kind of that same English, Irish, Celtic c- culture. Uh, they believe that on October 31st, that's when Halloween is, right? 
uh, the boundaries between the worlds of the living and the dead overlapped and so the dead could come back to life and cause problems for people. And so was, that's why it's a little scary, you know. And, and so they're thinking the dead can come back and that's why, where the idea of costumes came from. Because their, their attitude is if, uh, if our l dead loved ones can come back, uh, then who knows what else could come back. And there might be some really bad guys or bad things or bad stuff. And so uh, they, they developed the idea that if we could wear masks, we could fake them out. They, they must not think they're very smart. I, you know, it's like, I don't get that. Wear, wear a costume, it's like, oh, I didn't recognize that that was a human being. I thought it was, you know, whatever. I just laugh at some of the thought process. So that's, that's where the origin of Hall Halloween costumes come from. Obviously, we do it a lot better now. You know, we've got Batman and everything else under the sun. But... Uh, Superstitions that comes with this, right, is that because there were spirits coming and we don't know if they're like us, don't like us, and then the fear of how do we keep them happy, and that's pretty common with a lot of pagan religions where you have to appease the gods by giving them stuff so they'll leave you alone. And so it kind of connected with this idea of we put food out, we put treats out, we put fruit out, we do stuff that will hopefully make them happy. Uh, so that they won't mess with us and cause problems, right? And so um, the connection for how it gets to be sort of what we're familiar with, Halloween, uh, starts with the, the creation, the Catholic Church created a celebration for the um, righteous dead to remember them, and they called it All Saints Day. Uh, that was 7th century. Pope, Pope Boniface started this. He introduced the idea. And it was intended to be competitive. If you know Catholic Church history, you realize that they, 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 were th they had a problem with the pagan festivals. And so they attempted to try to Christianize them, to hybridize them. And uh, it's pretty obvious that some of that was at least sort of successful. Because what do we commonly refer to uh, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus? We call it Easter which is weird when you think about it because it's named Ishtar is a pagan god. But there was a celebration at the same time. They tried to blend the two and say, well, we're going we're gonna to call it Easter, but we're going to worship Jesus, right? And so we, st we still have remnants of that today, right? So uh, Pope Boniface started All Saints Day. Uh, he did it in the middle of the spring in May, and then they, Pope Gregory, uh, about 100 years later, 200 years later, decided... Uh, we should move it to the compete directly with this pagan festival of the what what we now know as um, Halloween, and so uh, they moved it to November first. The the and they called it All Saints Day or All Hallows Day, and so the evening before is All Hallows Eve, and that's where we get Halloween, right? So um, now. That's, that's the familiar, that's the holiday you're most familiar with. There's another one that I mentioned that uh, is celebrated by mm, hundreds, I don't, I don't even know how many millions, but uh, it's celebrated in Mexico and in Central America and surprisingly in large portions of South America. And it is called the Day of the Dead. Now, many of you may not be familiar with it because maybe you don't have a Latino background or maybe you don't have friends from Mexico or anything like that, but you're going to see that obviously we have a large influx of Latino uh, nations to our to our country, and as a result, you're going to see more and more these kinds of things. And I want you to be able to understand what they are because w if you don't know what they are, then when you look at them, you just go, "That's creepy. That's weird," because yeah, you have no idea what it's about. I I'm not saying that when you find out what it's about, it's less creepy, but at least you'll know, right? Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, a drawing and etching. This is an ancient one, a kind of very popular, famous one of uh, Calvera, the skull of Katrina. Uh, Katrina was the Aztec goddess of the dead. And she is kind of the central figure of this. Uh, Mex Mexican uh, cult culture or celebration has its origins in the Aztec culture. Now, uh, like many countries, they, they look back at their historical background and their heritage and they honor their heritage, you know, and that's, that's all fine and dandy except like many places when we look at what our ancestors were into and we compare it with biblical truth you go uh, these guys were pagans these guys were uh, very dark and very lost right it doesn't mean we hate the people but it means that you know they didn't have the light of biblical revelation so they 
They operated in superstition and folk uh, religion. And in this case, the Aztec culture, if you studied it all, you realize that they, they were uh, obsessed with death to the point that they believed in human sacrifice. And according to the best records we have, it's estimated that they, the Aztec culture sacrificed 250,000 people in human sacrifices every year. Okay, so uh, you're, you're talking about a, a death on a massive scale for religious purposes and human sacrifice. And so um, the Aztec culture, they had an entire month celebrating the, the dead uh, August and and during that time they paid tribute to Katrina the goddess of death who was portrayed as a skeleton and so that's why you're gonna see that symbol a lot associated with the Day of the Dead these are little uh, candy uh, skulls that uh, sugar skulls candy skulls uh, that are you'll see quite often they're all decorated in crazy wild ways um, but the Catholic, the Catholic Church changed the festival of the dead the the Aztec thing and morphed it into the day of the dead instead of a whole month long into one day and then timed it to can be uh, coincide with the all saints day or all hallows eve right so it gets connected in the same way as they did with europe somebody's getting their phone call <laughs> so uh, they connected in the same way that they did in europe with all halloween except this time it's uh, connected with the day of the dead november 1st and 2nd um, are national holidays in Mexico and uh, many several other South American countries so it's a national holiday you think our Halloween's weird well at least we don't have a national holiday for Halloween but okay and so since it's association with the dead one of the things that they do is they the people will commonly go and visit graveyards uh, many times they'll just hang out in the graveyards which does is kind of like why would you do that well, because it's, it's honoring the dead, right? So they go to the graveyards, they clean up the graves. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have had that experience where you go and visit a graveyard of somebody that you love. And, you know, it's, it's I don't know what your experience is. It's never very satisfying to me because I go, I, don't, I know they're not there. It's a placard or something like that. But sometimes you do it out of respect or, you know, whatever, lots of different reasons. And so they go there and they clean up the graves uh, because sometimes, you know, over time they get neglected. And so you, you go, it's a sign of respect. And so they pay their respects to their loved ones. Uh, sometimes they'll sit down and have meals there. Uh, sometimes they'll talk about them, kind of remember them. Uh, they also paint their faces as skulls or wear skeleton masks. And that's the connection to Katrina and the Day of the Dead. Uh, they will sometimes put altars in their homes to honor their loved ones. And certainly some of you say, well, that not that idolatry? In some cases, it probably can be. But in other cases, it's a way of just remembering the person and just saying, you know what? I mean, have you ever looked through a photo album of the people and going and you think about them? And so it could be that kind of thing. We don't know what's going on in everybody's hearts. But these are the kinds of fake face painting makeup that you'll see. And uh, some of this one's obviously quite high caliber, you know, pretty professionally done. But you'll see that, and if you don't understand the connection, you just see these people walk around with skull faces, and you're going, these, these guys are weird. And it's like, well, yeah, there's, there's some strange parts to it, right? But if we just step back and, and deal with it as, uh, think about it as human beings, we can certainly understand some of the motivations, right? Because we, we understand what it means, what, what death is like. When, when somebody you love has died, and you realize that sometimes that's hard to get over and sometimes you want to continue you, you sense the loss and uh, sometimes there's uh, grief that doesn't go away short quickly and sometimes it takes a long time for you to process that whole thing uh, the greater the amount of love the greater the importance of that person in your life the harder it is for you to release them let them go uh, you know move on that kind of stuff and so it, it's understandable that uh, many of us, when we have someone who's, you know, father, mother, grandfather, somebody that we love, child, we, we, we would love to have the ability to reconnect with them somehow. It's certainly understandable. It's like, well, of course that's appealing, but is it possible? And that's where we go according to what we have from God's word. He says, no, you can't do that. And so that's part of the freedom that we get. And, and it's actually... Uh, supposed to be freeing to us to go hey you need to understand what this is so you don't spend your whole life trying to do something that's not doable and so uh, we want to have a, a little bit of understanding for this whole thing and realize there's there's very human motivations behind some of this 
that we can relate to. That doesn't mean we approve of all of it and go, oh, yeah, well, I think it's a great idea. Well, no, let's, let's, let's examine it biblically, right? Uh, both of these holidays bring up spiritual issues. There, there's things that are kind of connected with this whole idea. Um, as believers, one of the things that I, I want to continue to challenge you guys is to, is to, to live by the revelation of God. This, this is God's word. He has revealed insights and truth to us that the rest of the world does not have unless they have this book and have the Spirit of God. So you have unique insights so that we will not be subject to following superstition or spend our lives in pursuit of myths, right? And so that's a great benefit that you and I have. And all these things that we're talking about, they all have spiritual impact. There's, there's spiritual issues behind all of this. And for you and I, uh, as we talk about some of the stuff, let's let's. I want to encourage you. Let's let's do our best to not be judgmental. And what I mean, for example, um, we we have this little harvest party thing that we do, and uh, most of the Christian parents will be thoughtful about the costumes that they put their kids in. And uh, but we're we're connecting, and uh, we're in proximity to the the village area where there's a lot of non-Christian folks that come down there, and some of them really, 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 really like the dark stuff. I mean, you can see them, they come in, and they'll have axes in their heads and blood dripping and, you know, kind of creepy, scary costume stuff, you know. And, and we have people that occasionally go, those kind of people shouldn't be coming in here. And it's like, isn't that really what we want? Right? I mean, I mean not that we're not, we're not appealing to them, but don't we, don't we want people to come in and go, hey, they're the very people that need the gospel, you know, just like we did. But, you know, so not judgmental in that sense of saying, you know, oh, how could you wear that? Well, of course they could let their kid wear that or they could wear that because they don't know any better. They don't know the gospel. They don't, they don't, so let's not be judgmental that way. Let's be wise in terms of our decisions and, and loving uh, because this is a challenging ho- holiday, if you want to call it that. So part of this issue is the the idea behind both Halloween and the Day of the Dead is that somehow the the dead can come back. And the the idea of we commonly refer to ghosts as a person who has died and they're they're coming back in a spirit form and they're being involved in our world somehow. uh, Giving you counsel, uh, whatever, you know, there's all kinds of different ways they can be involved. So what about ghosts? What does the Bible say about ghosts? Well, it addresses it very specifically. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, Man is destined to die once, and then the judgment. You see, there's, there's no implication that he can, you die, and then you have opportunity to, uh, like Scrooge and Marley, you know, the uh, Christmas, you know, st- I'm doing penance and making amends for my life, and that's why I'm back here. And it's like, no, none, of that, none of that happens. There's, there's no opportunity to fix to amend, to improve your eternal destiny. You know, it's like death, and then the judgment comes after that, right? And Luke chapter 16, we're going to look at it in a minute here. Uh, Jesus describes Hades, which is referred to sometimes translated hell or the grave. And he's talking about the condition of people who are conscious and uh, aware after they have died. And he gives us the insights about both the unbelieving dead and the righteous dead. And so we're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, and it, what he's describing there for us is what happens to, uh, specifically, there's a, a difference f- between believers and non-believers. And uh, there's a difference between those who died before the cross in faith and those who die after the cross. Because since the, the price has been paid for us, we don't have to wait for that sacrifice. It's been paid. So now for believers, because the price has been paid, we, we don't wait anywhere. We go immediately in the presence of God. Okay, so there's a distinction there. Uh, but what he's going to describe in here, we're going to look at is that th- what he describes is what happens to every unbelieving person's soul or spirit after they die. That they go to a place that is essentially a place of incarceration. Not, not like change like this kind of incarceration, but to be restricted to a location until the day of judgment. It's roughly equivalent to what happens to criminals today. You can ask some of our sheriffs if you want to check it out. But if you commit a serious crime, you will be arrested and incarcerated until the day of your judgment. 
right? You'll have your day in court, and then you'll be judged. And essentially, that's the same situation here. When people die in sin without a savior, they've committed a serious offense, and they are incarcerated until the day of judgment, which is the great white throne uh, in Revelation chapter 20. And we'll take a look at that briefly, too. And so um, people who go to that judgment are people who do not have a savior. Therefore, they're judged according to their sins. And every one of those people goes to the eternal judgment, the lake of fire. And so that's why Jesus came to save sinners from that, right? That's the, that's the only hope for a sinner is that they would have the Savior. If they have a Savior, guess what? They're saved, all right? Okay, so uh, here's Luke chapter 16. If you've got a Bible, you could uh, mark it and maybe put a bookmark in there for yourself. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, uh, and he says uh, he's talking about a guy named Lazarus who was a poor beggar and uh, had a very painful, difficult life, and a rich man. We're not giving his name, just a rich man. And he says, so it was that the beggar died and he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's the, the father of faith and it's, it's a picture of his embrace. And he's welcomed there. Okay. The rich man also died and was buried. And so his body's on earth. But he says, and he being in torments in Hades, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger into water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Okay, he's in torment, he's in pain. Um, he, he doesn't quite understand that things have changed because he was a rich man, so he used to be able to order people around. And he used to be in a place where he could receive comfort and mercy and he's asking for that, and Abraham's going to break the news to him, sad news to him. He says, uh, son, remember, in your lifetime, you received your good things. Likewise, Lazarus had a very hard life. He experienced evil things. But now he's being comforted, and you are being tormented. And besides all this, there is between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those from there pass to us. See, there's, that's the incarceration. It's like you're stuck there, and you can't get out, and we can't get in. Not that they probably would want to get in, but um, he says, then he says, once he realizes it's like, I'm here, and, I'm, and I have no options. Then he starts for the, probably for the first time in his life to think about other people. And it's quite clear that he was a self-centered uh, um, uncaring individual uh, and it says then he says I beg you therefore father that you would sp send him send Lazarus to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they come to this place of torment and uh, it, it's quite interesting based on these things I can I can tell you that with the authority of Jesus Christ that every person who dies has only one thing on, on their minds when it comes to wanting to communicate with the living. Tell them not to go to hell. Tell them not to come here. If they're lost and they're in the torment, then they're pleading, someone please go to my family. Someone don't tell them. If they're in the presence of God, then absolutely that would be the steepest desire of their hearts to say, please, please tell my loved ones how they can come here to this place of heaven through Jesus Christ. Abraham says to him, look, they, you want me to go and warn your brothers? You want Lazarus to go and warn your brothers? They've already been warned. Let them pay attention to the warnings that God's given them through the law and through the prophets. Let them pay attention to what God says. That's what this book's about. It's the, the good news of the gospel that, that God loves the world and yet he, they will face judgment if they don't repent and believe in his son. He paid the price so that we could have salvation as a free gift. And so he, he has made it clear, I want you to go to heaven. I do not want you to go to hell. He's provided a way that we could go freely. And we, we should heed that warning. Um, verse 30 says, no, no, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they need to see somebody alive, re revive from the dead, return from the dead, then they will repent. And he says to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. 
And uh, that's quite obviously true that there are plenty of people who won't listen to this book, and then you tell them, well, you know, Jesus died and he rose from the grave, and they go, eh. It's like, no, are you kidding me? No, it, the, the tomb is empty. It, this, it's an indisputable historical fact that the tomb is empty, and yet we have so many millions of people that are still not persuaded. You go, don't you get it? He, he's alive. He rose from the grave. And they're still not convinced. Revelation 20 tells us about this judgment. It says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. That means that it's going to be fair and truthful and accurate. By the things which were written in them, the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades, uh, so that includes our rich man, uh, were delivered, delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's what Jesus died to save us from, that eternal judgment, the lake of fire. Anyone's name, anyone not found and written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And you might, if you don't know the biblical background, you might go, well, how do I get my name in that book, the book of life? By believing in Jesus Christ. Because he is the Lamb's book of life. And it's you, when you become a believer in him, your name's put in that, la that book, and therefore you're secure and safe from this judgment. The judgment uh, is described for us in Matthew that there's only two destinations. Um, some will go away into everlasting punishment. Some will go to r eternal life, those who are righteous, and it's by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's no in-between. That's part of the, the issue here with these, these de day celebrations. There's, there's no in-between. There's no um, purgatory. Uh, that's kind of a Catholic doctrine, and there's no universalism type of a thing. That connects with Catholic doctrine of saying, well, you go to purgatory. Jesus paid for some of your sins, but you go there, and you suffer for a while. And if somebody prays for you, they can help you get out of there. If you spend a 1,000 years in there, well, eventually you get to heaven. It's like, no, Jesus died to pay for our sins, right? He paid for all the sins of all the world of all time. And it's, it's enough for all of our sins. And so there's no in-between. There's no purgatory. There's no reincarnation. You, you're appointed to die once and then the judgment. Not, not multiple times going around and around. Uh, there's no, be, because of those things, we understand there's no possibility of remaining on earth in spirit form as a ghost. It it's, does not happen. It's not possible, right? And so, the, the biblical truth lays out for us that the dead, once they've died, they have no part in the land of the living. They, they don't have any influence or activity. There's no staying on because of unfinished business or anything like that. Ecclesiastes, Solomon put it this way, their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Ne nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. It's, it's, it's like, no, no. It, it, now is the time, not, not later. For the believer, for this is the advantage for you and I, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we don't, we don't perish, but we have everlasting life by believing in him. And Jesus said in John 5, Most assuredly I say to you, him who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and he will not perish come into judgment but he has passed from death to life that's our salvation we've passed out of that judgment but what about good ghosts i don't know about you guys but uh i i would be surprised if there weren't people in this audience that have actually spoken to what they believe are ghosts uh, it's it's far more common than you might believe and most of the people say yeah i know but mine was a good ghost you know it was my auntie or somebody, you know, some departed person, right? And if someone has encountered what they call a ghost, according to the Bible, they absolutely cannot be the disembodied spirit of a deceased person. There's no possibility that the portrayal that you're hearing is accurate. That means it's deceptive. It's a lie, right? They are lying spirits. They are demons who present themselves as something that they're not for the purpose of deceiving people who will listen to them. Right? Coloss or Corinthians, Paul said, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by this. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose ends will be according to their works. Uh, they can look really good, and they can present themselves in ways that are very convincing if you didn't know the biblical truth that it's not possible. All right? What about praying to or speaking to the dead? Because that's part of the whole idea. And, and again, I, I, I mean, I understand. There's some people that you love that you'd love to have a continued conversation with. I, I would love to say things to my dad or to my mom. And, and so I understand the desire for that. But when we, when we understand what the truth is, you go, we can't do that. We shouldn't be trying to do that. Right? Isaiah says, um, when, why would you, why, when men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Consult, why consult the dead on behalf of the living? He's going, you have a living God. Why wouldn't you turn to him rather than uh, hoping to somehow contact a person? Uh, when, wh what about psychics and uh, the claim that they can somehow uh, summon the deceased and gain true and useful information from them. Uh, if you just keep in mind, it's like the purpose of de demons is to deceive. Then uh, people who are violating God's law and God's word and saying, I can do this, you should already go, wait a second. This is against God's will. Therefore, if you're contacting something, it's not going to be of God. And I, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, I mean, we think about it for us, it's... If we understand who God is, why would any of these things be temptations to us? I mean, understand the emotional part of it. You go, wait a second. If we understand who God is, why would I try to contact a beloved loved one and say, can you help me? Are you kidding? You have the opportunity to talk to the living God, right? And, and if we understand who he is, and we really get it, it's like there's no one who loves you more than him. I mean, I know some of us will go, my mom, my dad, they love me so much. It's like, not as much as God loves you. And, and he's proven that by laying down his life for you so that you might be saved. You know, there's, there, all of the best parents in the world, are, don't, they, they pale by comparison to the goodness of God. He's always attentive to you. Uh, Psalm 139 says that he thinks about you. He has more thoughts towards you than there are grains of the sand of the sea. He, he's very attentive to you. He cares about you. That's why he says, if you've got, you got burdens, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. All right? He, he is love in the perfect, fullest, godly sense of it. And then some people always go, well, what about the witch of Envidor? Okay, yeah. There's one instance in the Bible where someone was contacted who was dead and they were allowed to come back and talk to an individual. It's called, it's uh, in 1 Samuel 28. It's an account between Samuel uh, the prophet, who was dead, Saul, the king, who was in rebellion, and a, a witch or an occultist, uh, spiritist. Okay, so um, Saul was in rebellion and disobedience to, to God. And uh, he contacted this, woman, this witch to attempt to get some counsel from Samuel. And uh, what he's doing is strictly forbidden, and so he's violating God's law. Uh, anybody who consults with the dead is detestable to the Lord. God's going, I hate that because you're, you're going to get deceived and you're going to bring destruction. I hate that. Right? Saul's actions resulted in his death. So you go, yeah, it's in the Bible. Yeah. What happened to the guy? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, he died. Um, and it says in Samuel, 1 Samuel 28, because he was unfaithful to the Lord, he did not keep the word of the Lord, and he even consulted a medium for guidance. And so... Uh, the consequence on his life was that he died. And it's clear that God says, don't do this. You should not be doing this, right? Uh, the fact that we have this account there does not mean that it is genuinely possible for witches or mediums to contact the dead. It only means that God allowed it in this one instance. And if you pay attention to the, the account of it, the witch was as surprised as anybody. And she was freaked out. So it's quite clear that she wasn't used to having this actually happen. And so it's a one-time event, and uh, actually Samuel showed up and basically rebuked Saul for his foolishness. Why should we only pray to God? Well, we mentioned that he loves you. He's omnipresent. He hear, he's the only one who is able of hearing every prayer in the world. So he, he can be with you and hear you when you pray. He even understands your thoughts from afar. Um, 
A, a human being, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have that ability. I mean, nobody does. Not none of us, right? Okay, so only God has power. Um, he is omnipotent. He, he has all power. That's why he continually tells us, uh, nothing's impossible with me. Nothing's too difficult for me. All right? When it comes to us, if we were talking to another human being and saying, you know, hey, Doc Miller, would you help me? Uh, he, he probably would because he's a kind, loving man, but he has limitations. He doesn't have all power. And, and so why would we turn to another human being when we can turn to the living God who has all power? Um, Revelation chapter 19 tells us that. This is an attribute that no human being, dead or alive, possesses. Uh, when, it, when it comes to the Lord, he knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about all the decisions that lay out before you, the plan for your life, the purposes, your uh, personal character and his will for your life. He knows all that stuff. And you get, I know what's best for you. So why wouldn't we turn to him? I mean, it's, it's really foolishness. If we had the ability to contact Aunt Mabel, you know, this Aunt Mabel lived in the 19-whatevers, you know, and say, oh, I'm sure she could help me, right? But even if they could, but they actually can't. Uh, think about what a dead person would have to do in order to be helpful to you. Uh, first of all, they'd have to be able to hear your prayer. How would they do that? Right? They're either in hell or they're in heaven. They're not hanging out here on earth. There, there's no way for them to hear your prayer. They wouldn't know how to answer your prayer and they wouldn't have the power to answer the prayer. Now certainly this makes a lot of sense when we start thinking about some of the uh, practices that people have of praying to this saint or to that saint and going, well, this guy's going to help me because, because he loves you more than God. He, ca he can't hear your prayer, first of all. He doesn't have the answers you need and he doesn't have the power to accomplish it because uh, he's up there enjoying the presence of God if he's really a saint. Um, and if he's not, he can't help you either, <laughs> right? There's a lot of paranormal, paranormal interest in our culture, uh, spiritual phenomenon kind of things. But it's, it's sad when we look at it because instead of seeking truth about the spirit world, right? It's, I understand it's interesting and fascinating and a little scary and uncertain. It's like, but instead of seeking truth about it by communing with God and studying his word, so many people are allowing themselves to be deceived. They buy into stuff and you go, where did you get that from? Oh, I saw it in a movie in Hollywood. That makes it very reliable. <laughs> right. Praying for, th for the dead. Uh, there is no purgatory. There is no reincarnation. So praying for the dead seems like it would be really a waste of your time. Um, Hebrews says that it's appointed to us once to die and then the judgment. We can't, we can't change that. But there's something that we can do. We can pray for the living. That's the best use of our time. You, you should realize what a deception it is to take our focus from away from praying for the living and put it upon praying for the dead, which accomplishes nothing and wastes all of our time and energy. Sincere effort, sincere motives, probably so, maybe so, but it's wasting your, your time and your efforts. Instead of praying for the living, because now is the time, while we are alive, this is the time we have, the opportunity we have to love one another, to honor one another, to appreciate one another now, and we know that there's a time coming when we won't get that opportunity because they'll step out of this life. And so now there's a priority, a precious priority on using this time now. And that's part of the reason probably the adversary wants to get us away from that focus. Uh, C.S. Lewis said one of Satan's most deceptive tactic, tactics is to convince people that he doesn't exist. Right? And say, so, oh, well, it was occult stuff. And it's like, well, there's no devil. Oh, yeah, there is. And it's sad how many people think that he's just a symbol like Santa Claus or something like that, Satan would like nothing more than for have to have people dabble in the occult world of spiritism and necromancy. And w some of our kids, we gotta we gotta help them understand these things because they they think it's a game, they think it's fun, they think it's exciting and scary. Yeah, it could be all those things and a lot more. And so, uh, God's commandments regarding these things are designed to protect us from the schemes of our enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we certainly don't want our kids to wander into those things. We were once darkness, now we're light in the Lord. Well, let's walk as children of the light. Fruit of the Spirit, goodness, righteousness, and truth, and finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. 
and not fellowshipping with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, that's, that's a challenge, especially with some of the things that go on. You go, eh, we don't want to really participate in that. But there's some things that we can do that are really awesome. Be grateful for a harvest time and think about a harvest of souls and go, Lord, we want to see that happen too. You know, celebrating and, and directing our family in terms of traditions and celebrations um, because it really touches on life and death. It touches on those important issues that, uh, yeah, we've we got to value each other now because there's a time coming when we won't have that opportunity. and It's called death. One of us uh, is going to step out of this life and we'll never have that opportunity again in this life. And so let's make it count. Let's make it count how we treat each other. Um, as we close, I want to I ask a couple things of you. Um, I thought about how, how do you apply this lesson, and it's like, well, there could be some of us in this group that have had encounters with demonic stuff, with ghosts, with uh, occult practices. And uh, I would suggest that maybe as a result of that, you might want to come forward for some prayer. Not that you're possessed or any of that stuff, but just going, hey, you know, I just really want to, I just need some prayer because some of that stuff really bugs me still. It's, it bugs me that I was involved in that. And you could have a time praying with some of our prayer team here and just to, just to pray for you and pray that God would just give you, you know, confidence and peace and, and assurance. Uh, for some of us, uh, you might be here and you might be still mourning the loss of someone that you love. And it's it's a, a painful thing, and you and you you would you, you have that temptation to say, I want to try to connect with them somehow. That you might want to come and just say, you know, could you just pray for me that God would give me peace. For believers, there's a tremendous day of reunion coming, a time when we step into eternity where there's no more sorrow and no more pain and no more death. And there, one of the things somebody said is like. Heaven's a place where the, you never s use the word goodbye. You know, it's like none of that disruption of things. And, and so to have the sure and certain hope of that and, and to let that comfort your heart doesn't take away all the pain, but it causes you to realize it's like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to be there with them. And so maybe you want to come forward and get prayer for that. I, I, I hope that you'll feel safe enough to do that. Uh, there might be other reasons that you'd come forward to get prayer. Just as a response to say, God, you know, I really want, I just want to just pray with somebody this morning. So we're going to close with a time of worship, a uh, song or two, and uh, we're going to have some people up here to pray with you. Uh, so you just come during that time. Uh, let's have everybody stand right now, and uh, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing before we close. Okay, everybody stand. Okay, now I want you to look to your right and to your left, and... Tell the person that's on, on your right and the person that's on your left, it's okay if you go get prayer. Okay. All right. The reason I say that is because sometimes you're in the middle and you want to go get prayer, but you don't want to bother the person next to you. They just told you it's okay. Okay, so you don't have to let that stop you. Okay, so let's, let's pray together and worship people and come out. Um, all right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love and uh, thank you for the power of the gospel. An amazing truth that you've given to us so we we have insights into life and death and uh, beyond the grave and things that take place in the grave and and what the what life's really all about and uh, lord thank you for this uh, incredible truth that you've entrusted to us with your book uh, and your holy spirit that opens it to us thank you lord i pray you would encourage and strengthen people and that anyone that's uh, needing prayer would just uh, come forward and just be blessed by a brother or sister praying for them and uh, you touching their life today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.